Hi, everybody. My name is Yvette Subramanian. I work here at Citrus, and I'd like to uh, introduce today's speaker. Before that, I first would like to welcome our web viewers. As you know, this is broadcast live, and our, the other campuses of Citrus do get together and watch this. So pay hello to everybody at Merced, Davis, and Santa Cruz. Um, as always, please, people in the auditorium here, please remember to recycle and compost in the back. Um, if there is tin foil, that is not compostable. That needs to go into landfill, but everything else is compostable today. And also, the Big Ideas competition is still open. So for students who have ideas on energy, clean water, open data, democracy, the proposals or the pre-proposals are due on November 5th. There's information in the back, and there's a lot of money up for grabs for people who have um, great ideas for this year. So I'd like to introduce today's speaker. Alexei, Dr. Alexei Poznikov. He has just joined the Department of Civil Engineering here at UC Berkeley. He received his PhD in computer science it's from Switzerland, and he did research in machine learning methods and computer vision. Uh, he then worked at the Institute of Geometrics and Geomatics and Analysis of Risk at the University of Lausanne. His group is developing I2 Maps, which is a modular software framework for knowledge extraction from spatio-temporal data streams and working towards the city scale project to demonstrate this research. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Doris Poznikov. Thank you for the introduction and uh, very welcome to this talk. I'd be happy to entertain you for the next uh, 40 minutes. So uh, I joined the Department of Civil Engineering just recently and I ident identify myself as a professor in smartest cities because I like the concept and I like how people think about cities nowadays. But I'll start with a more traditional view on smarter cities, how companies see it or how people from technology see smarter cities and how they identify this concept. So usually a smart city is viewed as if you instrument the city infrastructures with lots of sensors, do the analysis of the data coming from the centers, and then you do some regulation back on the, on the infrastructure. So it's really an approach where people work with hardware, with all the city systems, and then they hope that citizens become happy after this you know, successful feedback cycle, which actually doesn't apply to people, but apply to the infrastructure which people then use. <clears throat> and this is a traditional view, and this is how companies develop their approaches to smarter cities. They look at energy, water, communication infrastructures, transportation infrastructures, uh, and then they try to connect it all with uh, city government, with businesses, and create this all interconnected view where we got lots of data from sensors and we got certain controls, all of this. Now, that's great, that's great. But I think that the definition of smart cities should be actually slightly shifted towards actual people and citizens who use all those services. Because it's not just enough to connect all the systems together and uh, hope that citizens be happy. It's actually very important to redesign the systems specifically centered on serving citizens. And how we do it? Well, this view is also quite accepted nowadays because we now get access directly to what people say and we actually can use citizens as sensors because people express their opinion via social media or via other means and we can listen directly to what they do and what they say and what they would probably like to be improved in the city. And this idea is very powerful, and to really make it work, we need to extend our data analytics capabilities quite significantly, because data generated by sensors is, to some extent, is controllable, so we got control over the quality of data and so on, but data generated by people is very heterogeneous, and it varies in volumes, it varies in quality, uh, we need to really think about how we do analytics on this kind of data. Now, if we can do that, then we can possibly build novel approaches to optimization and control of the system, which would better match the uh, desires and requirements imposed by, by citizens directly. And this is a very powerful idea. Right? And uh, there was a lot of hype around it, 
people have been talking about City 2.0, which is created by citizens who are co-producers of the services around and so on and so on. And, and there are good reasons why, why this idea got so, many, so much attention. Of course, it's, it's very, very attractive uh, uh, to be able to build systems like this. Okay? Now, data, and data is always in the center of this, right? So what kind of data we can use to build better analytic services and better control over uh, the systems, which now include citizens in the loop? There are lots of data, and um, probably two main sources, which I identified here, will stay around for quite a while, and we'll get more and more access to it through companies or through partnerships and so on. And these are the data coming from uh, mobile devices. First of all, there's the data coming from your cell phones. And here you got really high volumes of data. It's collected for billing purposes by uh, telecom companies. And uh, the very strong and uh, important aspect of this data is that it is giving you the implicit social network of users. Because companies know who you call, and so we can recreate the full social network in the city. That's very important. The only thing which is missing in this kind of data sets is the content of these communications. But the content is available for the social media. And this is another type of data sets which are becoming available and those are services like Twitter, Foursquare, and other things where people actually express something in natural language. And this data is also provided through the companies, through their APIs, which are currently public. But because there is a certain movement, and companies try to lock in all this data because they try to monetize it and build services on top. But actually, even in the open access, uh, you can do a lot. Especially you can do a lot because you've got content here, you've got high volumes here, and volumes here are actually also growing. So by combining these two sources, you've got really powerful uh, uh, so source of information to design the systems for cities. Okay, small example. Um, we worked a little bit with a cell phone company and tried to look into the volume of calls in the city of Dublin in Ireland. And if you simply plot things as a heat map and visualize the daily dynamics of uh, what's going on in the city, you would see this. Okay. So here what you see is a daytime variation of the volume of phone calls. Okay. So now it's day, now it's night, now it's day, and now it's night, and so on. What, there is, what is quite interesting here is that um, you could start recognizing patterns by simply looking you know, at, at this variation. And those patterns, they are different in nature. They are, by different in nature, I mean they're both temporal and spatial. You could see the spatial variability of activities. And for example, if there's a big event going on, like celebration, you would evidently see this hotspot of celebration. And you would also see this hotspot on, in time, because in time you would have you know, a spike of activity at this particular time moment. Okay? And, uh, Surely you could build on top of the existing machine learning and data mining methods to try to understand those patterns. Okay. Of course, you'd like to do it under certain conditions. You want to be able to process data when data comes as a stream. You want to have this very scalable and so on and so on and so on. And um, what's interesting here is that if you build this, then you could include this kind of modeling 
into you know, con control and infrastructure. And I'll come back to this idea in the conclusion. For now, I'll try to show you the conceptual view of how I see the systems and how I see the, the, the modeling framework I'd like to develop for, for this kind of system. Okay? So the modeling framework here is very simple. So we know that our city is actually composed of different venues. This could be you know, restaurants or transportation facilities and so on. And people use them in certain ways. So people move across the city. They do their uh, whatever they're supposed to do during the day. They meet people. They form groups. They do something together. They, they move across the city. And uh, all the system can be represented as they're interacting as, as two interacting networks. Okay? So here we've got our users, our citizens. They are connected into a structure which we think of as a social network. And they perform certain activities in the city. Okay? So we got links in between users and also links to the venues. And this set of venues in the city is also connected into a different network. It can be an accessibility network, or actually it is a multiplex network because there are certain relationship, relations between the venues. It's not just accessibility, it's, it's other types of things. And what we see in the city and this, the system where we try to recognize pattern is actually an interacting, uh, two interacting networks. The data usually come from either here, we observe a link between people, uh, here, we observe a transition. Okay, we observe a transition from one venue to another. So a certain u user have moved. Or from here, when people check in, let's say check in at a, at a, at a particular venue and expressing some opinion. And what we are going to do is we are going to look into certain aspects of the system, and I will show you several examples of how we can identify uh, what's going on. Uh, in the city by doing data analysis uh, using this representation. Okay? Our first example will be looking at social structures in cities. Right? Basically, what we do is we only look at a small subpart. We look at all the citizens and how they are connected in between uh, themselves. And what we see is that social networks got really strong spatial pattern. It appears that the social network in the city is built of quite well-defined communities, which are also spatially contiguous. We did this analysis for Ireland, and this is a close-up view on Dublin. And one thing you can see in Dublin is that it is composed on several communities. And there's much stronger interaction within the community than between the communities. And the reasons for that are various. So those could be uh, groups of people from different socioeconomic classes. There can be various reasons for this kind of segregation. But it's very important to keep that in mind. Okay. Uh, most striking thing for, for, for this data that, that we, we have observed is the very strong north-south divide in a city. And in this particular example, I show you all the calls made from people from this cell to all the other cells. And the cell in the network, in the cell phone network, is colored in red if it received a call from somebody uh, from here. Okay? So basically, uh, to say it in, in simple words, people from here only call to the north part of the city. And people from here never call to the north, they only call to the south. So the, this is a very strong social divide. And uh, this kind of divide actually exists in the um, daily cycle of the evolution. And we could look into how these communities evolve. You know, we observe this divide all the time. So the city is actually composed of the two parts. And there are some small scale things here and, you know, during the lunchtime uh, or the office hours, you would see the emergent community in the business district, and then people come back home, and then the community structure recreates around your friends and families, 
and then it follows the, uh, the geography of a residential area, but not the business districts. And we can do all this kind of analysis. Okay. If we look at the right part now, on the right part of our system, we've got the network of venues. And to analyze this network of venues, we could use similar methods to try to identify the spatial structures on the venues of how, how the city, how the physical part of the city is built. And we can do this, and I'll, here I'll also touch the aspect of the, of the dynamics, because I will look at the venues not as a static uh, set of places, but I will look at the venues as if people are using them. So I will look at the whole set of check-ins, which are collected from the social media, and we'll try to look into the dynamics of how particular venues are used, and then try to infer how particular areas of the cities are used. So to do this, we will represent our data set of all the check-ins and venues into a sequence of documents. Okay, so this is our timeline. This is something going on as a day and night cycles. And uh, uh, our data set is the set of check-ins. So a person traversing the city checking in at places, expressing some opinion about this place. And we will look into the all set of check-ins within a particular time interval. Okay? And within this time interval, we've got a particular set of check-ins. We know the locations. We know where people are coming from. So we've got a dynamic origin destination matrix. And we've got some natural language content, because every, every check-in is actually contained text. And now we'll be looking at the this sequence of the subsets. Okay. And we'll try to decompose this sequence into something more meaningful than just a set of origin destination matrices and a set of textual documents. And of course, there are models for that. Right? There are models in machine learning for that, the latent Dirichlet allocation models, and uh, many models build on as extensions of those. And they're very useful because they do exactly the job which we, are, we need. They decompose this whole set of, of documents into a set of topics which we can now interpret. How we do this? Well, we do this by just looking into uh, how this day-night variation can be decomposed and try to understand the semantics behind by looking into individual topics. Okay? And some topics are very, very evident. They are mainly the activities. In the morning, they are related to transportation. You know, you can see at the natural content, at the natural language content of, of your data. This is a temporal pattern of this topic. You can see this morning here. So this is a morning topic. And you can see the spatial pattern here because you know this, where those venues are. Okay. Other topics from this decomposition related to different kind of activities, and you can identify nightlife topics. You can see which areas of the city uh, actually uh, got venues for kind of nightlife, and you can see its temporal evolution and so on. And you know, there are many funny things here. For example, you can see the intensity of this topic grows from Monday to Saturday and Sunday, and you could see this very high thing uh, on, on weekends. Right. Uh, what else you can do? Well, you can try to characterize cities in terms of uh, in, in terms of the way people use them. Okay. So, for example, here on the map on the Manhattan, each color represents the cluster of the uh, area where the profile of how people, the profile, the topical content of this area is similar. So what I mean by that is you could look at the particular area on the city here, let's say on this, this cluster here, and during the day 
this area is being used in a particular way. You know the intensities of activities which are being performed here by citizens. And uh, you could build these functional profiles for the areas. Okay? So I'll give you one example. This purple thing here is the nightlife. And this is about the Times Square, uh, the Times Square in Manhattan. So this, this is very active in the night. And you could see this topic is very active here. And this is another area, and its functional profile is different. And this is a residential area, and its functional profile is, is very different again. And as opposed to zoning, which people do in, in, in planning, we can actually infer the actual way uh, the city is composed of various activity zones. Right. So we have done analysis of the left side of the system. We have done some analysis on how this right side of the system works. And now we'll try to bring things together. Before we do that, we will look into the detection of anomalies and events. Okay? So what I mean by this is we will look into if there is a particular anomaly going on in the city as opposed to some regular activity, and we'll try to extract these anomalies and analyze them. Okay? And then we'll bring it all together, and I will show you why we, we actually have done all this work. Right. To start with, we'll play a little game. Uh, for those who cannot see, and probably nobody can see, I'll give you the temporal extent of this example. It spans from September 23rd till October the 6th. So those are several weeks in the past. This is the Bay Area. And the data set here is all georeferenced tweets in the Bay Area. And this is a particular event. And this event got its temporal context. It is very high intensity on October the 1st, the evening of October the 1st. And this is its spatial extent. The game is simple. I give you this information. You try to think of what it could have been. OK? Try, try to find like what, what kind of event that was. What year? Uh, a few weeks ago, two weeks ago. No, that was explosion on the campus. Okay? So if you got a model which can identify this kind of things, get to the original sources of information, and extract all the media available for this event, you could basically know a lot about what's going on in the city. Okay? Now, the other event. Here is your temporal context. Uh, dates are September 25th, 26th, 27th. This is a spatial extent. Bay Bridge? Hmm? Bay Bridge? Okay. Mm, no. No, three days here. Okay, just baseball. Okay. All right, the other event. Uh, the date is September the 20th to 21st. Mm, no, no, no. But it was the same time, but no, that's not it. OK, uh, that's an iPhone 5. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, and uh, finally this. <laughs> exactly. So it's not actually an event. This is a part of a regular routine in the city. You see? And this particular thing is a Starbucks. Right? And uh, before I continue, I should have to say special thanks to Kahal Kofi, who is a PhD student here and who put this demo together. Okay. So what we have seen is that all these dynamics 
which we explored, is composed of routines and events. And events got different dynamics, you see? So here it's a sharp front here, and also sharp decrease. Here we've got event of the same time which continues several times, you know, sub-events. Here what we've got is anticipation of an event on the night, sharp front again, and then the decay, which is slower. And some events are not events, but they're part of the routine. And so we need models to find those events and identify what kind of routines exist in the city. And uh, these models exist. And they, there are various assumptions you have to make to, to get events out of this, all, all this timeline. And when you do this, you can actually build quite powerful storytelling uh, applications. We've done some work for Ireland. We looked at all the tweets. We identify significant events from there. Uh, there's lots of things going on on Twitter. And you could see at various movie uh, premieres, at various sport events, uh, the TV shows, uh, and so on. Not all events are spatial-temporal. Some events are just generic. Uh, but some events are spatial-temporal. So for example, this oxygen here, it's, uh, it's spelled correctly. It's actually the musical festival, how, how they call it this way. And if you look at this particular event, this oxygen festival, this is the intensity of this event extracted from the data. And this is its spatial context, so where people are talking about it and what they're actually saying about it. And uh, you can actually track the evolution of this event through time. So if you look uh, later in how this event develops, you could really see that people talking differently about it. So in the, when it only starting, it's a several days musical festival. Right? So several days. People talking about going there, they can't wait it to happen. They say that Sunday is the best day of it, and they hope it won't rain, and so on. On the actual day of the event on the last day of the best day of Sunday, they say it's really great and it's on and uh, they, they like it. Now, we're trying to connect all the system together and now from the particular events we also can get to know who actually attended it by tracing back those users. We know where they live, we know how they get to the place so we can now connect the dots together and build this whole, the, the, the evolution of the whole system. Right? And actually, this is I'm just trying to show that if you zoom in into a particular event venue, the resolution that social media provides you with is, is really amazing. You can see the main stage of event, the backstage, the parking lots, like everything. OK. Uh, connecting things together. We looked into the social structures. The social network. We looked into the spatial structures, not how it was planned, but how it has been used. We looked into how these two systems interact to some extent. We've learned that there are routines, there are events, and then the interaction of the systems can be modeled as a combination of social behavior and spatial choice models. So what I mean by that is that our users, they select, uh, they make a choice of where they're going to go, what they're going to do, and if they go in with their friends, uh, which, which group of friends they would prefer for this particular activity. Okay. And we can bring this all together. Now, the analytics in this full system is quite complicated. Uh, so I would say that state of the art of the, of the re research here is looking at the particular uh, slices of the whole system. There's not much been done on the, you know, on the work which actually brings everything together. So most of the research here is taking subparts as we did. Taking the social network, taking the venues, the venues network, taking particular events and so on. It's very hard to bring it all together, but it's becoming possible. Uh, what is certainly possible now is uh, take this representation, 
take the data set and try to build an agent-based simulation for what is going on. Right? You can simulate your population, you know your environment, and you can test various models of human behavior to see if they got anything to do with reality, and you can validate your models on the real data. And we've di we, we started this kind of work for, for Dublin in Ireland, and uh, we built a traffic micro simulation. Okay. So basically what you do here is uh, you s we simulated every single car in, in, in Greater Dublin, and these people, these agents, they perform their daily routine activity uh, together with their friends, they meet in people, they come back home, and so on and so on. And it's not only social media or cell phone data used here. Of course, they, we, we also fuse the traditional data sets into here, like a, a travel surveys and sensors and so on, and they try to, to calibrate it uh, really well. Now, what we have not used in this data is traditional transportation data sources like traffic, uh, like loop counters on the roads. We only use these loop counters for validation. And it's surprising that actually you can reproduce the volumes on the, on, on the, on, on the main highways pretty accurately. And uh, this is a count of the cars on particular highways, and this is our model, the, the uh, dark red one. And this is the actual data with the, you know, with the natural variability envelope here. The interesting thing is that the most valuable part of this new data set for transportation is that you can reproduce all the social activities during the day, which you cannot actually measure. So usually you conduct surveys, you concentrate on the morning and evening commutes, but you don't really know what people do during the day, and this new data gives you access to that. Right. Okay. So... Once again, um, the takeaway from this, from this part is there's enough data around to model this kind of systems. Uh, there's enough data to validate this kind of systems. Machine learning field is develop, developed well enough to scale the systems to the level of the whole cities, or the whole Bay Area. The data is quite representative. Of course, you need to correct for biases and so on. Uh, and um, you can get lots of new insights from this. Now, and this will be done. There's a massive body of work going on in this domain. What I think we should be doing right now is not doing this analytics, really, but trying to build uh, control approaches, trying to rebuild the ways we control those systems. And uh, with this idea, I will, I will conclude my talk, and I'll give you how I would like to restructure this typical view of the smart cities based on this crowdsourced data. I would actually like to, of course, use direct access on this crowdsourced data, citizen as a sensor, participatory planning, participatory everything, direct democracy, everything. Of course, I will be doing this data analytics, but at the key, at the key uh, of my developments, I would put this you know, system level optimization. So I would try to see to which extent we can do analytics on what's going on in the city and help people to self-organize through, you know, through recommendations or other kind of engagement in a way that benefits the system, the whole system at, at, at the high level. And uh, this is a very interdisciplinary work. But I think it, it got real promise. So thank you uh, for listening. And my thanks also goes to the funding sources and people who have been working with me on this. Thank you. So does anyone have any questions? Uh, so my question for you is, uh, 
I mean it both as a technical question and a kind of general question about your uh, your intended impacts is how do you deal with uh, uh, accuracy, precision, uncertainty, error in, in terms of feeding it through your entire system and then in terms of uh, drawing conclusions in the end and being able to to give some account that, especially for conclusions that may not so um, so cleanly match up with our intuitive senses. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that uh, yeah, even here. So your data comes from different sources, and those sources which are controllable and where you have quality guarantees, let's say sensors from the infrastructure like loop detectors on the highways. Uh, you could use this to validate the models, right? For the quality of the data coming from here, you got no controls. But you can do optimal sampling strategies there, so you could try to find reliable sources. So once again, uh, for your question, you use data of high quality to validate your models, you concentrate your development of getting your models right, and you use soft data to calibrate those models or to learn the parameters of those models. Any other, any other questions? Okay. Uh, maybe this is, I don't mean it to be a facetious question, but, but going back to, to uh, the, the, the exp the campus explosion uh, example, uh, th there was some activity with respect to whatever uh, whatever categories you were using before the explosion. Could that be used as predictive, perhaps to prevent the next one down at Stanford? Mm. Uh, <laughs> or, 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 or certainly perhaps earthquake prediction based on correlation. Uh, you know, the, the basic question is, is, is really the correlative probabilistic models versus something that has some kind of structural aspect uh, and, and maybe more seriously, uh, with respect to city dynamics, the examples you gave are, are very uh, tactical, almost ephemeral. Uh, from one point of view, the users are citizens, and the venues, it's really properties and land use. That's, and, and I also notice money didn't appear within your correlation. So at, at that level, uh, and there are structures that, that are very explicit. And, and, and also structures that are implicit in there in terms of developers' motivations and explicit the legal system and the way the city manages it. So uh, there's a mishmash of questions there, and I, I guess I'd give it to you to answer any one you choose. Okay. Uh, so your first question about this explosion being visible before it actually happened, it's noise and data, people talking about explosions in Iraq, for example, and so on. Because... You know, to, to filter out this particular event, you need to do some 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 more processing. And there's also be noise and data right, from the previous question. There will always be noise, so there will always be uh, some variability due to many reasons. Your, your model only captures what it can capture, not, not more. Uh, for your other question about the, I like this part of implicit and explicit uh, structures. And uh, I think if you know that there is a structure, you should arrange your model so that it incorporates this implicit structure as much as possible, but not too much, you know? And by, by this not too much, how you find the trade-offs, I mean, machine learning got a very nice view on these things, right? You should not overfit on, on, on data, and you should keep your models generic enough to still fit it and be well in terms of predicting things. And this, this, this is the way which we should uh, use when, when building this kind of models. So incorporate implicit things, but not as hard-coded, but only as a guidance. Now, for predictive things, uh, of course there's lots of predictions uh, which can be done here, and many, um, many companies actually work really hard to, to make it happen, you know, they try to understand uh, what your next activity would be and redirect you from Starbucks to 
some other uh, other place. Right? They they try to capture your behavior and recommend you something to do, uh, or place an ad in the context of your next activity. Of course, there's lots of prediction going on at individual level. There's not too much prediction going on on the on the systems level for, for the whole city, uh, and this is a very interesting area. So basically. Obviously, like the obvious question is, uh, if you look at the, the very start of my talk, I'll give you an image. Mm. Okay, let's say this one here. I'll start this animation once again. Okay, so put in pause. An interesting question is, what if I only got data from here? Can I, using this data, predict what's going on here? Yeah. So how much data you actually need to capture from the city to be able to reproduce the whole system? And those are interesting questions. And I think that the successful prediction here is the one which uses models which are actually behavioral, which captures not just the, what we observe, but the hidden, the latent parameters. And those latent parameters describe human behaviors and our social and spatial choices. Okay. In terms of purely oh, data-driven approaches, of course, there are correlations. People, you know, looking at these correlations, try to find causality relationship between various things they observe. But I think we should look deeper into the behavioral part of why actually we observe all this. Any other questions? What to say? Okay. Well, thank you again for a fantastic talk.